Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. Also brought to you by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. And by the Washington Turfgrass Seed Commission, helping our farmers produce the highest quality turfgrass seed in the world. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gorenson and welcome to Washington Grown. Here in Washington, our food is grown by expert farmers who have learned from previous generations. But just as important as the people who grow our food today are the people who will grow our food tomorrow. So in this episode, we're learning all about the next generation of farmers. Tomas is visiting Malone Farms during their busiest time of year, harvest. I don't think people understand how strong a work ethic you need to have to run a successful farm. And I'm making homemade pretzels at Cascadia. Do I get one more? Yeah, uh, get, get to work. You? Get to work. <laughs> you are laughing me. Then we're reconnecting with a young farmer who's teaching the next generation of agriculture. They are the future of agriculture, they're our future consumers, and it's really important that they are well versed in all matters of agriculture. All this and more today on Washington Grown. This is harder than it looks. It's a little baby pig. <laughs> That's really, really good, babe. That's a little party in a little glass. Well, hello there. Gobble, 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 gobble. Oh! No TV bites here. I'm going to dig in. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Need a good place to watch the big game? Look no further than Cascadia Public House in North Spokane. This chic, modern space is a great spot to enjoy some drinks, some company, and some great food, too. I love the atmosphere. Uh, it's amazingly friendly and the people here are super nice. It's like a great place to come for like a date night or just with friends. Fun, young, but also everyone's comfortable. It's a modern-ish gastropub. Owner and chef Justin Oliveri prides himself on a fun, easygoing atmosphere with lots of great food options. We've kind of uh, classified ourselves as kind of Northwest Gastropub. I don't know if that's a real term or not, but that's, 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 <laughs> that's what we've been telling people. That's what we're people. calling it. Yep. <laughs> There's still great food on the menu, great beer, and the customer service is always awesome. I will try something new every time I come here, and everything is good. If I'm out here with my family, I bring food home to my family. So yeah, it's that good. Yeah, I think uh, most of the menu items were kind of created with that idea of locality and being close to home, so kind of finding the ingredients that we could get. Um, near us and kind of building from there with kind of that palette in mind. Everything they cook back here is, is pretty fantastic. I have not eaten anything here that I have not liked. You get the sense that everything's made from scratch. It's just the only place like it. Later in the show, Chef Justin and I will make Cascadia's famous pretzels. So what's the learning curve on this learning for the first time? I would say a few months probably. <laughs> oh, and here I have to do yeah. it on camera? Yeah. I'm in the center of the state near Cooley City, Washington, visiting the Malone family. They are a fifth, going on sixth, generation dry land wheat farm. I'm Jeff Malone. We're in Douglas County, Washington, about five miles outside of uh, Cooley City. Jeff farms with the help of his parents, his wife Kate, and their two young sons. We grow mostly soft white wheat here. We're growing dry land wheat because that's pretty much the only crop we can grow. Um, in this rainfall area, we're getting six, seven inches of rainfall annually. When you're harvesting this kind of wheat, tech is a big part of that. And it's obviously grown significantly over the past five, 10 years. You know, I'd say 10 years ago, we were just starting to get our feet wet with uh, GPS tractors, combines were starting to drive each other straight. So when GPS first came out, was it easy to adapt to that? There was a learning curve, I'd say. Within two, three years, everybody kind of started to adapt to it. And pretty soon, if your GPS wasn't working, you were broke down. Technology has been a game changer for the Malone farm. This season, they added a new combine with a huge 45-foot header, which is that big, huge turning wheel that cuts the wheat. You've got significant length now on that big header, so how much time reduced of your harvest time? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to say we'd be close to about a week's really? cut-off time, yeah. When I was a kid, 
all the old timers said, oh, you can't watch a 22 foot header. You know, there's just too much to watch. But just because of GPS, auto steer. So you couldn't have that length without the technology assisting. Exactly, yeah, there's no way that it would work. There's no way you could watch 45 foot, just like the old timer said. It's harvest time for the Malone family, and I asked Kate what role they play on the farm. We are parts runners, and the kids are very good window washers. They're great at picking raw. Their time will come in the field, which I'm sure can't get here soon enough for them. Passing the farm from generation to generation takes time and a special relationship. It's really neat. It's really neat to see Jeff and his dad work together to farm together and to see how much his dad has to teach him. Just how much Jeff values being able to learn from his dad and how much he looks up to him. Do you already see the foundation being laid for what Jeff's going to be doing with your boys? So the only uh, stipulation we put on that is that the boys must leave home and they must go to college and get an education before um, there's anything to come back to. I asked Kate what she would like people to know about Washington farmers. I don't think people understand how strong a work ethic you need to have to run a successful farm. And I think the pride you get from working hard to make this happen, to support your family and to feed people. I'm extremely proud of my husband and my father-in-law and I wouldn't choose another life. Hey, let's go. Wash the ingredients can definitely make your food better. And one of the best ways to feature fresh local produce is on a pizza. Well, here at Mangia, pizza is what they do best. People really love the pizza experience and just everything that comes around with it. Matt is the operations manager at Mangia. And alongside Tim, the owner, they cater events like weddings and parties. A lot of people wanted that cook on site, that full experience where we can fire everything. It smells great with the apple wood burning. Pizza's a craft and we're always continually trying to fine tune it and make sure that we can serve the best pizza out there. Both our ovens cook at about 900 degrees. Yeah. 900 degrees out of a trailer. Yeah. That's impressive. It gives that nice smoky flavor that you wouldn't get in a traditional, you know, gas uh, or electric oven. So you're gonna have that another enhanced layer of flavor. Well, tell me about the foundation of your pizza, the crust itself. So the crust is, I think, the best thing that we do. Shepherd's grain is flour uh, sourced from the Palouse. Well, that's a really great high quality product that we use for our flour for our pizza dough. Now it's time to put the pie to the test and see what people think of Mangia's Washington grown pizza. Do you guys like pizza? Yeah. Yes. What makes a good pizza? It's got a good dough. Sausage, pepperoni. Pineapple and jalapeno. Chicken, bacon. I just like um, pepperoni and cheese. If it's meat, put it on a pizza. Well, I want to have you guys try this pizza. That's really good. Is that good? Yeah. Really good. It's light, it's cheesy. It's not greasy. There's cheese on it, but it's not overwhelming. It's not making my hands all wet. You can tell that this isn't like frozen crust. The dough is great, it's crunchy, perfect. The flavors are like really yummy. I'd recommend this to anybody. So would you give this pizza a thumbs up or a thumbs down? We still measure wheat in bushels. How many pounds of wheat are in a bushel? We'll get back to you after the break. Coming up, I'm making Cascadia's famous pretzels. Do I get one more? Yeah, get, Am get I to lapping work. you? Get to work. <laughs> you are lapping me. And we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest trying out Papa Drexler's Bavarian pretzels. There are 60 pounds in a bushel of wheat. We're back at Cascadia Public House in Spokane. Energetic, lively, and fun, this bar is the perfect spot to hang out, relax, and have a good time. I live close, so I'm here all the time. Far more than I can count. Like, <laughs> once every couple weeks. <laughs> Sometimes more. You come in here, they're super friendly, they always know your name. It's my favorite place. We've kind of uh, classified ourselves as kind of Northwest Gastropub. I don't know if that's a real term or not, but that's, 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 that's what we've been telling people. That's what we're calling it. Yep. <laughs> Owner and chef Justin Oliveri takes pride in keeping the menu locally sourced. Kind of our theme has been uh, sourcing as close to Spokane as possible with focus on sustainability for the future. It's just the only place like it that's comfortable and fun, has great food. Really nice locally sourced beer and the ingredients. I will try something new every time I come here and everything's good. Do you think that you know using ingredients that are closer to you, does it affect how the food tastes? I think so. I think uh, just fresher and uh, just knowing that 
the environmental impact on getting that food to the restaurant uh, was lessened by the fact that their transportation is, is, isn't as far. Everything that they cook back here is, is pretty fantastic. I have not eaten anything here that I have not liked. Now it's time to get into the kitchen to make some of Cascadia's famous pretzels. This looks like great dough. Yeah, so the dough, um, we start in the morning first thing. It's got to get done before we open, so first thing, it's a few hour process to kind of get the dough from start to finish. The base of the dough, though, is shepherd's grain. Good Washington grown wheat going in there, yep. so what do we do? So this is one pretzel here. Yep, take the dough ball and just kind of roll it in our hands first. Try to kind of elongate it a little bit, kind of flip it around. So what's the learning curve on this with some of your employees when they learning for the first time? I would say a few months, probably. <laughs> oh, and here <laughs> I have to do yeah. it on camera? Yeah. Well, what's wrong with this picture? That should work Is as that well. okay? Yep, so okay. we're gonna get it kind of on the cutting board, and we're just gonna kind of start moving it around, kind of getting out those big spots. Is there a key to making a good pretzel? I would say it definitely is gonna start out with kind of the ingredients that are going into it. It's gonna be yeah. kind of the most ideal start, and then just the I think the procedure is very important, making sure that the yeast is proofed before okay. you before you mix it, sure. and then make sure that it gets a real good knead, and that's looking about there. Okay. Perfect, so I think the easiest way first is to kind of grab it by the ends and just kind of go like that, and then we're gonna cross it, and then we're gonna twist, and then fold it back, and then I kind of pick it up about oh, right and there. Then, like Look at that, it's a pretzel. Do it like that. And then they uh, finish kind of rising once they go back in the cooler. Sure. There'll be a little bit more like puff up. So any of these uh, imperfections or anything like that yeah. is gonna, gonna come out of it. Yum. You finished that one really fast, so I need to step up my game. And with pretzels, are they just baked? We throw ours in the fryer. In the fryer, okay. Which kind of makes it a uh, kind of a- Extra special. In, in between of a pretzel, donut, fry bread, kind of all, Which is all into one. all delicious. Yep. Do I get one more? Yeah, get, Am I lapping work. you? Get to work. <laughs> you are lapping me. Might have you do the rest of the batch. There we go. Yeah. Look at that beauty. They look okay, great. Okay, so what's next? Next, they're going to go in the fryer. Oh, okay. After the pretzels are done frying, Justin sprinkles some salt over the top and serves it with a beer cheese mixed with stone ground mustard. This looks delicious. Ooh, that's hot. <laughs> Might be a little warm. Oh my gosh. They're so light and crispy. You know, sometimes yep. pretzels can be real dense. Yeah, they're pretty, yeah, they're definitely fluffy. And I think that's like a little second rise while they're in the pan after sure. we rolled them. Kind of puffs them up a little bit and then. Oh, those are so good. I'm just gonna keep eating. Thank you so much for yeah. showing me these things. Yeah. I love it. To get the recipe for Cascadia's pretzels, visit wagrone.com. Once a year, a small group of Hasidic Jews makes the long journey from their New York home to a wheat farm here in Washington. Special contributor John Schuler produced this story for us. The July sun beats down mercilessly on the dry wheat fields of eastern Washington. It's a dry heat. Almost no moisture at all remains in the air. A group of Hasidic Orthodox Jews, visitors from a faraway land, have made their way to these dusty fields all the way from New York to find suitable wheat to make special bread for their Passover celebration. I make this for matzahs for Passover. That's be like, not like a bread that can grow like that. That's supposed to be like crackers. That's the, I must make it very fast till it go into the oven. Not be observed or empty to be like, every, everything is handmade. The rabbis have specifically come to Eastern Washington because it's so dry. According to the Torah, they have to make their Passover bread without any trace of leavening, which can happen if the wheat kernels get wet after they ripen. The men start by carefully examining the wheat, making sure that the kernels have not gotten wet since they ripened. One telltale sign would be if the kernel showed any cracking or sprouting. Yeah, I must look on that, if that's no sprouty, see? Okay. That's what I'm looking, that's it. Before we cut the wheat, make sure because even when wheat is still connected to the earth, if it comes to rain or other things, it could get like blown up. You could see on the wheat actually, it gets blown up, it gets cracked, it gets, and that's a problem for us. The wheat grown in dry land, Eastern Washington, is some of the only wheat grown in North America that can meet their stringent demands. They have to, clean the combines, they have to clean the trucks, they have to clean the grain elevator, they have to have somebody stay there all the time while, while it's being harvested. 
The men take extra care and time in cleaning out the combine, making sure that no old wheat will contaminate their product. Then, they ride along for every step of the process, making sure the wheat never leaves their site. Uh, yeah, and, and after I could start to harvest, make sure no termination over there. Nobody touch that and seal it until I get it home. Under the watchful eye of the rabbi, the wheat is harvested into the combine. When the combine is full, it drives to the side of the field, where the wheat is unloaded into a semi-truck to take to the storage bin. Another rabbi rides along in the semi-truck. Back at the farm, the men carefully inspect and clean the bin where the grain will be stored. Any hole which would allow the wheat to contact water must be discovered and dealt with. From the cutting till it's made into the actual matzah, we have to watch it all the way. It shouldn't get any you no know, contact with water. But once you get a contact with water, we have only 80 minutes to finish it. We have to, you know, if not, it gets leaven. We will do everything what we can to fulfill the commands of the Torah, but this especially is very uh, beloved command and it's a holiday, it's a happy holiday and the memory is the reason we eat matzah is to remember the, the generations before when out of Egypt, the whole, it's a beloved and it's also strongly commanded, the Torah, the Torah is very strongly commanded. Finally, the men seal the bin, ensuring that their grains will not be touched until they can return to package and ship their bounty on the long road back to the faithful in New York. Coming up, we're reconnecting with a young farmer who's teaching the next generation of agriculture. They are the future of agriculture, they're our future consumers, and it's really important that they are well versed in all matters of agriculture. There. We're in my backyard and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about irrigation. Now, irrigation is something that intimidates a lot of people, but it is incredibly necessary in your garden. So there are a few different things that you can do to make your garden a success and get ample water on it over the course of the season. One thing you can use is an impact sprinkler. Now, if you have a flat area, an impact sprinkler is the way to go. It may not work as well on raised beds because the bed itself will block whatever's behind it. And so the impact sprinkler won't be able to reach that area. However, if you're growing in ground or in your lawn, this is a great way to go. Another thing that you can use is just a simple sprinkler like this guy here. Now this guy kind of delivers water like rain. It's very gentle. I prefer to use drip systems, both soaker hose and emitters. Soaker hose is really nice because it can be made into different shapes so you can work it through an existing bed and it delivers water down its entire length. So you can use it on seeded crops or established crops. Emitters are nice because they deliver water directly to where you want it. And you can either see them, they're either little tiny drippers that come off the line or they're actually holes that are directly put into the line itself. They're great for things like cabbage, broccoli, stuff that you want water to flow right at. No matter what system you choose, I definitely recommend getting a timer. A timer is essential to getting enough water on your garden all year round. Having an easy and efficient watering system in your garden will make your life so much easier. Back in season three, we featured a young woman who was very passionate about agriculture. One of these, combined with hundreds of thousands of others, can produce a loaf of bread for a family. Maya Wall served her freshman year of college as a Washington State FFA officer. Instead of going to my freshman year of school, I served the FFA. Today, we're catching up with her to see where she's at. Although a few things have changed, her passion for agriculture is still strong. So we met five years ago. Yeah, That's crazy. I know. So tell me about just life on the farm and what you enjoy about it and what are some of the challenges? Growing up as a farm kid, I am lucky enough to have understood this life for a really long time, but that doesn't mean that I haven't encountered new things in being part of this farm. I love that we have the freedom to live out in a beautiful place like this with little to no neighbors. It's quiet, it's, I mean, everything you could ever really want. Maya married her husband, Jake, a year ago. Together, they live on a wheat farm run by Jake and his brother. 
In the time that I've been on this farm and watched them work, they've gone from pretty conservative and traditional methods of farming, which are still happening now, but also I've watched my husband and his brother kind of step into more um, advanced techniques. It's really, really cool to see them try new things, experiment, and find what works for our area. When we first talked with her, Maya's goal was to work in legislation as an advocate for farmers. Today, she's helping the industry in a different way, as a high school ag teacher. I realized that while legislative work and policy work is vitally important to our industry, my place was to be with students and with the youth. I still want to tell the story of the farmer, and I believe that I have the influence to teach my students on how to do that as well as teaching my students about where their food comes from. They are the future of agriculture, they're our future consumers, and it's really important that they are well versed in all matters of agriculture. As a teacher and young farmer, Maya realizes that she and her husband are not only inspiring and educating the farmers of the future, they're also the next step in agriculture. I think it's an exciting time to be an ag. I mean, our neighbors just over the hill is another young married couple who's doing the same thing we're doing. And we have a lot of friends who have come back to the farm, which is something that wasn't happening and maybe still isn't at the rate that we need it to. Um, it's not a secret that farmers are aging and not enough people are stepping into those roles. As far as the future of agriculture goes, we're proud to be a part of it. We're proud to rear the next generation of agriculturists, whatever that industry may look like. So we know that we are doing our part and are being a part of an industry that's gonna be ever changing. And we're the people that have got to roll with those changes. We're in the kitchen at Second Harvest Food Bank and we are here for a little taste testing and I've got my partners in crime with me today, Tomas over here and we have Laurent here. Thank you Hello. for being here. Laurent Good to is be here. a chef and a restaurant owner of Fleur de Sel. And we're in Second Harvest, which yes. is we're in their teaching kitchen where they do uh, you know, a lot of uh, teaching folks how to use yeah. the food that they get from the Second Harvest Food Bank. You may hear some forklifts out in the distance because they are this working is a food there, bank. Yes. And they are uh, feeding a lot of families and they do some great things. So we thank them for letting us be here for our taste testing. And this episode is about next generation farmers. And Tomas, you and I have had some great moments meeting yeah. some of these farmers who are taking us into the future with farming. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to go out there and just to see these stories of multi-generational families, fourth generation, fifth generation. I mean, it's inspiring just to see how close they are with their family, but then how much they're giving back to the community. It's, it's pretty cool. What would be Washington State without our farmers? Right, so we're talking about wheat with Papa Drexler's Bavarian pretzels. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. Cool. You know, I think we all baked a lot <laughs> during uh, that pandemic. Right? Uh, so I think that's a great recipe to, to yeah. add more on and the I list. I love pretzels, and you saw how much fun it is to, to do the, you know, the twist the and the flip twist, and the whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is Papa Drexler's Bavarian okay. pretzels by Papa Drexler, Papa Drexler. right? Papa Drexler. <laughs> fun to make. Traditional pretzels are great with a nice mug of beer. Yeah. Are Papa we going? Drexler is after my own heart. Are we going to have a beer? I no, hope so. we're going to have a beer, but we're going to have the pretzels. Let's <laughs> right. see how they're made. Pretzels are one of my favorite things, like like this. Really? You know, like a, oh, yeah. 
I love it so much. Oh, so beautiful. I'm excited to try it. Yeah, Look it looks really thing. good. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the salt, you know, on top. You can use a, you know, rock rock salt. Right. A little bigger Get it salt. Crunchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like how it's crunchy on the outside and nice and fluffy, soft on the inside. Very much so. Very mm -hmm. warm. It's got that nice kind of salty pretzel taste. It's great. We just need some uh, some beer cheese sauce. Uh -huh. Or some spicy mustard. Watch oh, a yeah. football game and we're go. all set. We are all set. Jennifer says, uh, this recipe is fabulous. These were a huge hit. We tried half of the batch with mustard and then the other half with cinnamon and sugar. Oh, there you go. And yeah. She says, either way, they were amazing. I bet they were. You know, it's like walking on a path. The recipe, you can follow it, but please make it your own. You know, add some other ingredients. Add what you like in those recipes and they, they will be yours recipes after so i think it's uh, yeah. it's great to have a uh, uh, you know a good starting frame point. a frame but yeah. Yeah. don't be afraid to go outside the frame yeah. absolutely and great oh, form yeah. on on these right <laughs> Melissa did a great job Melissa at second harvest picked this up she did a great job nice so papa drexler thank you so much these yeah. are delicious to get the recipe for papa drexler's bavarian pretzels visit wagrone.com Today, tomorrow, and for years to come, the next generation of farmers will continue to take care of all of our food needs. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. We'll see you next time.